a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Murder of Ennis Cosby Ennis William Cosby was the only son of American comedian Bill Cosby. On January 16, 1997, Cosby was murdered near Interstate 405 in Los Angeles, California. He was shot in the head by 18-year-old Mikhail Markasev in a failed robbery attempt. Cosby's death resulted in significant media coverage, public outrage and an outpouring of support for the Cosby family. Seeking the $100,000 reward offered by the National Enquirer, an acquaintance of the shooter provided information that led to Mark Arsev's arrest in March 1997. Subsequently, Mark Arsev was tried and convicted of first-degree murder and attempted robbery on July 7, 1998, and was sentenced to life in prison the following month. Mark Arsev maintained his innocence until 2001, when he admitted to committing the murder and asked that appeals in his case stop. Early Life and Academics Ennis William Cosby was born April 15, 1969 to Camille Olivia and William Henry Cosby Jr. He was their third child and only son. Cosby had four sisters, Erica, Erin, Ensa, and Irving. When Camille was due to give birth to Ennis, Cosby joked during a television special that, it had better be a boy, you hear, Camille? And Camille, off-screen, responded, right. Ennis was born at Cedars Sinai Medical Center Los Angeles and grew up in Southern California, Pennsylvania, and New York City. He attended George School, a private boarding school outside Philadelphia, where he played football, basketball, lacrosse, and track and field. He suffered from undiagnosed dyslexia, which caused low grades and friction with his parents, one of whom had an honorary Doctor of Education degree, Theo Huxtable. Bill Cosby's TV son on The Cosby Show, was based on Ennis, and this was reflected in storylines with Theo struggling in school until he was diagnosed with dyslexia. It was also written into the script that Cosby's character, Cliff Huxtable, had been wrong in blaming Theo for his poor grades. This mirrored Cosby's real life, as he had felt guilty for thinking Ennis had struggled academically, because of a character flaw. Ennis Cosby's dyslexia was diagnosed when he entered Morehouse College in Atlanta, where a friend encouraged him to be tested. After the diagnosis, he spent a summer semester undergoing intensive academic training at Landmark College, a private university in Putney, Vermont, established exclusively for students with learning disabilities. He then returned to Morehouse where he made the dean's list when his grade point average jumped from 2.3 to more than 3.5. In his free time, he tutored students at elementary and high schools. He earned a bachelor's degree in 1992 from Morehouse, which he followed with a master's degree from Columbia University in New York in 1995. While at Columbia, he worked at Alfred E. Smith Elementary School and also tutored students struggling with learning disabilities. His friends recalled that he kept a low profile and did not want special treatment, and would just say that his father worked, in business, when asked why he had lived in three states, at the time of his death at 27. Cosby was working toward his doctorate in special education at Columbia University's Teachers College. He planned to set up a school for children with learning disabilities. He once wrote, The happiest day of my life occurred when I found out I was dyslexic. I believe that life is finding solutions, and the worst feeling to me is confusion. Ennis was recalled as friendly and outgoing, and he would greet people with, hello, friend, a greeting that became his legacy. His parents had the phrase put on a sign near his grave, and several months after his death, his father released a jazz collection titled, Hello, Friend, to Ennis with Love. Murder. Cosby was in Los Angeles in January 1997, while on winter break from his classes at Columbia University. In the early hours of January 16, 1997, he was visiting friends in Los Angeles and driving north on Interstate 405 through the Sepulveda Pass when, at approximately 1 a.m. he pulled off the freeway onto Skirbel Center Drive to fix a flat tire. He called a friend, Stephanie Crane, who drove to meet him. 
She parked behind him to light the area with her headlights while Cosby changed the tire. She later testified that a man came to her window and told her, open the door or I'll kill you. Frightened, Crane drove away, but after approximately 50 feet turned her car around and came back. She saw a man running away and found Cosby lying on the ground in a pool of blood next to the driver's side of his dark green Mercedes-Benz. He had been shot in the head. It appeared robbery was a motive, but Cosby was still wearing a Rolex watch and had three $20 bills in his pocket. The Los Angeles Police Department contacted Congresswoman Maxine Waters, a close friend of Bill Cosby for many years, to ask for his phone number. Waters declined to give it to them. Instead asking another close friend, Essence magazine publisher Ed Lewis, to be the one to tell Cosby. However, the police contacted the CBS studio which produced his new series, Cosby. Filmed in New York at Kaufman Astoria Studios in Queens. Cosby was on set at the time when producer Joanne Curley Kerner informed him of the death of his son. Los Angeles police later spoke with him and discouraged him from flying to Los Angeles. Aftermath The Cosby family received an outpouring of support from friends and the general public. Truckloads of flowers were delivered to the family's home in New York City, and strangers left flowers on the spot where the murder took place. U.S. President Bill Clinton, Vice President Al Gore and South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu personally called Bill Cosby to offer condolences. Within 36 hours of his death, the high number of calls asking how Cosby's memory could be honored prompted his family to form the Ennis William Cosby Foundation. At the time of its inception, the foundation's purpose was to benefit programs focused on those with learning disabilities. Cosby was buried on January 19, 1997, in Shelburne, Massachusetts, after a funeral held at the family estate. Media Criticism National media received criticism for its immediate coverage of Cosby's murder. A news helicopter from local station KTLA captured aerial footage of Cosby lying dead on the road on January 16, including close-ups of his body, which CNN broadcast later that day. The footage prompted outrage from CNN viewers, who had not been warned that graphic footage was about to be shown. The network received hundreds of calls of complaint and anchor Bobby Batiste to apologized on air for broadcasting the footage. In the hours after Cosby's death, photographers and news cameras gathered outside Bill and Camille Cosby's Manhattan home. Bill Cosby, returning home from the studio in Queens after being informed of Ennis' death, was met with a media circus outside his home. When pressed for quotes by reporters, Cosby said of his son, he was my hero. The family began making plans for a burial, and decided they needed a private funeral in Shelburne away from the media. Journalist Howard Rosenberg of the Los Angeles Times wrote, CNN carelessly crossed a line Thursday by airing a tasteless close-up of the body of Bill Cosby's murdered son, Ennis, lying in a pool of blood. Will another line be crossed by media badgering his famous father and the rest of his grieving family for comments about his death? On January 18, two days after the murder, the Fox News Channel issued a statement saying its employees will not stake out the home of actor Bill Cosby or attempt to contact any member of the Cosby family for comment about the death of Mr. Cosby's son. The family issued a statement saying, We do not accept people coming to our homes, because this is a time we want to ourselves to find solutions to questions in our hearts. Rosenberg also criticized Los Angeles CBS affiliate KCBS-TV. KCBS, Action News, for blurring out the face of the sole witness, Stephanie Crane, but only after they had already shown footage of her at the scene. And journalist Harvey Levin had identified her as the witness. Crane, the maternal aunt of actresses Melissa Gilbert and Sarah Gilbert, went into hiding and avoided the media despite being offered a small fortune by tabloids to sell her story. Rewards Gray Davis, then Lieutenant Governor of California, announced a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Cosby's killer, which led to further media coverage and criticism for the offer of taxpayer funds as a reward.
Republican Assemblyman Gary Miller called it a transparent political stunt by Davis, who later launched a successful bid for governor. Miller complained that the Cosby family was wealthy enough to offer its own reward, and that there were no similar rewards offered by the state to capture the killers of children of non-celebrities. A crime victims advocacy group, the Doris State Crime Victims Bureau, also criticized the reward. It's offensive, said Kelly Rudiger, executive director of the group. There are many unsolved cases that could be solved with the incentive of cash. This has generated a lot of verbal aggression against Gray by our members. They're asking, why Cosby and not Smith and Jones and Brown? At the time of the murder, Davis was acting governor as Governor Pete Wilson was out of the country on a trade visit. Wilson's spokesman stated that the governor did not proactively volunteer awards, but would act only after local law enforcement requested it. On February 8, Wilson rescinded the offer Davis had made, citing the Cosby family's request that no taxpayer money be used as a reward. The Cosby family has my heartfelt sympathy, Wilson said in a statement. I also regret that the Cosby family has had to respond to a barrage of media attention with regards to rewards offered by the state and other entities. It is my hope that withdrawing this reward brings a close to this issue and takes a burden off the Cosby family. A $25,000 reward from the City of Los Angeles and a $15,000 reward from Los Angeles County was similarly withdrawn following the family's request. Tabloid newspapers The Globe and The National Enquirer also offered rewards for information that were not withdrawn. Investigation and Trial The police stated they believed the motive to be an attempted robbery or carjacking committed by a stranger who had been drawn to Cosby's expensive Mercedes convertible. Crane described a young, slender white man, approximately 25 to 35 years of age, who was wearing a knitted cap. A composite sketch of the man was drawn and distributed to the public. The police received more than 800 tips they were investigating, including a tip in January about teenager Mikhail, Michael, Mark Arsef. Mark Arsef, then 18, was born in Lviv, Soviet Ukraine, and immigrated to the United States with his mother in 1989. He was ultimately apprehended in March after the National Enquirer received information from an acquaintance. Mark Harsev, who had previous arrests for drug possession, pleaded not guilty. While some of his friends initially stated they believed he was innocent, the grand jury was convened three months after the murder. Mark Harsev was charged with first-degree murder and attempted robbery. As Cosby was murdered during a robbery attempt, it elevated the murder to a capital offense, special circumstances that made Mark Harsev eligible for the death penalty if convicted. Two acquaintances of Mark Arsef, Sarah Peters and Michael Chang, testified against him at the grand jury. Peters and her boyfriend, Eli Zakaria, were with Mark Arsef on the night of the murder and were high on cocaine and heroin. She testified they had stopped to use the payphone at a park and ride lot about 450 feet from where Cosby had pulled over to fix his flat tire. Peters testified that while Zakaria was on the phone, Mark Harseth walked off without saying where he was going. Within a few minutes, Peters heard a loud noise like a car backfiring, and Mark Harseth ran back to the car, saying, Let's go. We've got to get out of here. Let's go. Mark Harseth refused to tell them what had happened, but they stopped at a wooded area that matched the description of where the murder weapon was later discovered. Michael Chang who with another friend later attempted to find the gun, told the grand jury that Mark Harseth told him he killed Cosby. He recounted that Mark Harseth told him that Cosby was frightened when he pulled the gun and demanded money, and that Mark Harseth shot Cosby because he was taking too long to give him money. After Mark Harseth was indicted by the grand jury, neither Peters nor Chang testified in Mark Harseth's two-week trial in July 1998, from jail. Mark Harsef sent a letter to an acquaintance in which he admitted the murder, writing, I shot the nigger. I went to rob a drug connection and obviously found something else. Mark Harsef's attorneys unsuccessfully tried to argue that the letters were forged and that Zakaria was the killer. Mark Harsef was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life.
plus an additional 10 years in prison. 2001 Confession In February 2001, Mark Arseff sent a letter to California Deputy Attorney General Kyle Brody asking that all appeals in his case stop. Mark Arseff wrote to Brody that he had killed Cosby and that he wanted to do the right thing by confessing. Although my appeal is in its beginning stages, I don't want to continue with it, because it's based on falsehood and deceit," wrote Mark Arseff, who is incarcerated at California State Prison, Corcoran. I am guilty, and I want to do the right thing. More than anything, I want to apologize to the victim's family. It is my duty as a Christian, and it's the least I can do after the great wickedness for which I am responsible. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?